Hello everyone, my name is Halsey. Welcome to another Sunday School lesson from the Kojak Legacy Edition. Don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe, or even to leave a comment. This is the first lesson in Unit 2 of our Fall Quarter. The theme for this quarter is Sustaining Hope. All the lessons in October is focusing on Dark Nights of the Soul. Bible scripture for today, Sunday, October 6th, is taken from Job chapter 19, verses 1 through verses 7, skip to 23 through 29. Lesson title is, Even So My Redeemer Lives. Before we go into our lesson, we will have prayer. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercies. Lord, give us, give us what we need. Give us what we need to endure. Strengthen us, Lord. Strengthen us in our efforts, Lord, and help us. Help us, Lord, to hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, knowing, O oh God, that you are faithful and that you are able to promise. Help us, Lord, to be a light to this dark world. Help us, help us, help us, Lord, to be that ray of hope hope that this dark world need to see and help us to be that witness of the Lord Jesus who is our Redeemer that he lives he lives within our hearts help us Lord to be that light and help us to be that hope and we say thank you we thank you Lord for all of your many blessings and all these things we ask in Jesus' name we pray amen this lesson is outlined and it is divided into two sections Six. Section 1 will deal with Job speaks to his friend's verbal attack. That's verses 1 to verses 7. Section 2 will deal with uh, Job's response to his situation. And that's verses 23 to verses 29. The aim for this lesson is that we understand that Job had unwavering belief in God's redemption even as he was made to suffer and uh, that we affirm that though we suffer much God loves us and offers us redemption and acknowledge ways we are loved and blessed during times of trouble. Before we go to our printed text, we will just add a little bit of background. So our lesson today is coming from the book of Job. And so who was Job? Well, we learn back in chapter 1, in verse 1, that, that Job was a perfect and a bright and one who feared the Lord and hated evil. We learn uh, that he had uh, 10 children and was a man of great wealth. We also learn in chapter 1 that uh, one day, one day, that Satan presented himself before the Lord and uh, that the Lord asked him what he thought of Job. And Satan accused Job of honoring the Lord only because the Lord blessed him. So the Lord allowed Satan to take away all of Job's wealth and killed his children. Then uh, later on, the Lord allowed uh, Satan to afflict Job's physical body and chapter 1 Job chapter 1 and verse 22 lets us know that in all this Job sin not nor charge God foolishly with all his affliction he sinned not and when the news are spread about what Job was going through, his uh, afflictions, and his friend heard of his situations, they accused him of wrongdoing. 
and they verbally attacked him for days, on and on and on and on. But uh, Job uh, stood his ground on his innocence. We will now go to section one. It will deals with Job speaks to his uh, friends verbal attacks. Verse one, reading from the King James Version. Then Job answered and said, verse two, how long will ye vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? How long? We see here how a Job asked his friends, how long? How long will you continue to harass me and accuse me with harsh words? Job uh, described their words as being harsh, hard, hard enough to break him into pieces. You know, we have this uh, common phrase that uh, says, uh, sticks and stone may uh, break your, your bones, but words will never harm you. That's a lie from the pit of hell. We see here how uh, Job is describing uh, his friends, the harsh, hard words that they were saying to him and it causes him to feel like he was uh, being uh, broken into pieces. That's how harsh their words were uh, to him. So words matters. And when we use uh, negative words or when we accuse one another using negative words, it can cause great harm. This little organ that we have in our mouth calls the tongue. It can be very dangerous. And when we use it the wrong way, we can cause someone great harm. James has something to say about this little organ, this little tongue that we have in our mouth. Listen to what he says about it. James chapter 3 and start looking at verse 6. It says, And the tongue is like fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defiles the whole body, and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. 7. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind. 8. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Did you hear that? This little tongue in our mouth will spew out words that is likened unto deadly poison. If we see what Job is going through right here with his friend, they spewing out deadly words to him that causes him harm to the point that he says he feel like uh, they, they're breaking him in pieces with their words. Back to the lesson, verse 3. These Ten times have ye reproached me. Ye are not ashamed that ye make yourself strange to me. And Job here, you know, he continues to talk about his friend, well, his so-called friends, how the accusations kept going on and on. They should be ashamed of their themselves for doing it without any evidence of what they were accusing him of. And when we think of uh, accusations and how it's very, very easy, very easy to point out someone else's faults and their shortcomings and their sins, just like Job's uh, friend here is accusing him of sin uh, to make him feel guilty and feel terrible. They weren't saying anything to encourage him or if he did uh, fall short to correct him no, they were making sure that they're making him feel bad and feel guilty. You know, that's that human side of us. 
that we need to come up out of. All of us need to come up. And if we feel the need to correct somebody because we think we know that they're in the wrong, they're doing wrong, then scripture teaches us that we should do it out of love. We shouldn't point finger. You know why? All of us sin and come short of God's glory. None of us have any rights to accuse anyone because we need to look ourselves in the mirror and making sure that we are doing what we supposed to be doing and not pointing fingers. We I should always uh, make making sure that we're watching what we're saying to others because just one little word can tear someone down. One little negative word can tear down someone's uh, self-worth and, and destroy our relationships. Do you know how many our relationships are destroyed or being destroyed because of false accusations? And I will see what Job says to them, that they should be ashamed of their, themselves the way they were dealing with him, the harshness that who, who, who treat their friends like that. We are to always aim to treat others the way we would like to be treated. Uh -huh. Verse 4, And be it indeed that I have erred, mine error remained with myself. And a Job here, he made a declaration that my mistake or my sin is my own responsibility. It's between me and the Lord. Whatever uh, was going on, Job here was willing to take that responsibility that whatever action comes my way is between me and the Lord. And that's how it is. It's between us and the Lord. Whatever we have done is between us and the Lord, not for us to f point fingers at others when we have no clue what is going on behind the scene. For a sin is our own concern because one day we have to give account. We have to give an account for everything that we have done. So it behooves us to mind our own business and go look in that mirror, look on our own actions and our own behaviors are making sure that we are doing what we need to do to be in right, rightful place with the Lord. Because we don't know what the Lord is doing in other people's lives. Sometimes he's attesting them to cause them to grow in their faith. So it behooves us to mind our business and leave other people's business alone. Verse 5. If indeed ye will magnify yourselves against me and plead against me my reproach. And we see this self-righteous uh, behavior that Job is talking about. They were trying to show up Job, humiliating him, magnifying his uh, trouble, his situation, and, and making him feel a humiliated and disgrace and again it's that natural side of us that wants to be seen and want to uh, feel important that we get these urges uh, to point a finger at other people and not knowing that we all sin and come short of God's glory and God is looking at our hearts and what's in there Job had a clean heart uh, for the Lord but they didn't know that. And that is why we have to leave people business alone. We don't know what is going on. We can't be pointing fingers every time we see uh, something is going on with them. We can't be start pointing fingers that, oh, they're sinning. Oh, yeah, that is why this is happening to them. That's none of our business. Mind our own business. Go look in our own closet and clean out our own closet and leave other people's business alone. Just like right here. Job didn't know what was going on behind the scene. I mean, he even uh, uh, blaming the Lord for turning his back on him and abandoning him. Uh, but uh, his friends, they had no business pointing fingers because they didn't know what was going on. And that is why they had was to apologize later on. The Lord made them, he made them apologize and had to uh, bring Job a sacrifice offering. That's what they get.
Don't point fingers. And that's for all of us. Leave other people's business alone. Verse 6. Know now that God had overthrown me and had compasses me with his net. And Job here continues to maintain his innocence. He said, I, listen, I didn't do anything wrong. The Lord is doing this to me for whatever reason. And again, he didn't know that the Lord wasn't his enemy. His enemy, his real enemy was Satan. Satan was behind the scene accusing our Job. And, and the Lord gave him permission to test Job. Because uh, back in chapter 1, Job chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Where have you been? Then uh, Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth. And from walking up and down it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, who, one who fears God and hates evil? 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? 10. Have you not made an edge about him and about his house and about all he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. 11. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. You hear that? that that's Satan. 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only upon himself put not forth your hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And we see here how Satan, the devil, how he attacked uh, Job's motives, saying that, you know, Job was blameless. Oh, Satan hates when we uh, serve the Lord in spirit and in truth. He hates that. He, he See what he did? He attacks a Job's a motive of being blameless before the Lord. Satan here wanted to prove that Job was only serving the Lord because the Lord was blessing him, not out of love and honor and respect. And he's still doing the same thing today. He's still going to the Lord accusing the uh, believers. He's still doing it. And this is why we should not point fingers at one another. We need to help one another because we have the same common denominator, Satan. Jesus uh, teaches us in John 10 and 10 that he comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. That is his goal for all believers. That is why we need to what? Uh-huh join together and fight him back with the word. Back to the lesson, verse 7. Behold, I cry out of wrong, but I am not heard. I cried aloud, but there is no judgment. And we continue here to see uh, the overwhelming uh, theme of suffering. Job suffering. Job continues uh, to express his frustration and his despair at the lack of justice and the lack of understanding of his situation. Be because uh, despite his plea for help and his desire for uh, justice, he feels as if his words are falling on deaf ears. And this right here, it paints a picture of being abandoned, of feeling hopeless. And, you know, at some point, we too can say that we've been there. We, we feel as if, you know, the Lord is not hearing me. When you pray, think about it this way. When you pray, and the Lord is silent, very silent. How do you feel? How does that make you feel? 
like a job. Have you ever feel abandoned and unheard in the midst of your suffering? Have you ever experienced that loneliness that comes with suffering? And we see here how a Job's his experience, how uh, it's highlighting that nature of suffering, human suffering. We're living in a fallen world, and this fallen world that we live in, it comes with suffering. And that is why we have to hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering. Suffering will come. It's up to us. To hold fast to God's unchanging hand because he alone can get us out of it. He alone can see us through it. And a, a, a great portion of uh, these verses are not in our lessons, but it continues to talk about the sorrow and the, the depth of Job's suffering and how he was feeling. Everyone was staying away from him. It's a lonely place to be. The relatives, the neighbors, the friends, all gone. And it causes Job uh, to, fee to, to feel forgotten. And again, how do we respond to God's, his silence? It's only one way to respond is to keep on believing, keep on trusting that he is with us. And uh, that he will see us through it, whatever that it is. We will now go to section two. It will deal with Job's response to his situation. We now jump to verse 23. Verse 23. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. And now uh, that uh, Job is responding to his situation, he said we, he has this strong desire for his words to be written down. And what would be the significance of his word being written down? Well, for one, it would be that permanent record for future generations since he was not seeing any immediate vindication. His wishes that his word uh, would be written down, it would serve as that evidence of his innocence. And future generation would benefit from it. And we, where we are today, we're benefiting from it, knowing that when we don't understand and when uh, the Lord is silent, we keep on believing and keep on trusting. We have to know that, that deep in our hearts, we're innocent. We keep on believing and keep on trusting and ask the Lord to help us and to keep us that whatever he's doing in our lives, we will pass the test and he will get the glory. Verse 24 that they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever. Job was uh, here looking for a permanent testimony. And as I said, where we are today, we are benefiting from Job's response to God and how he kept the faith. He wanted to make sure that was written down so uh, as again, future generations would benefit from it. Verse 25, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And we see a shift right here. How a Job shifted from his helpless state to now looking ahead. He's seeing hope ahead, and that hope is his Redeemer. He now expressed his unshakable faith in the midst of his suffering, clearing uh, his belief in the existence of a Redeemer, a Redeemer who is alive, 
who will stand on the earth in the latter days. And this is a, even in his sorrow, even in his sorrow, a Job could see the light. And the term redeemer, it in the Bible, it, it often associates with being rescued, being delivered, being uh, bought back, buying something back. And of course, it ultimately appoints to a salvation. And that's what Jesus did for us. Jesus is our redeemer. Job here, he expressed his firm belief in the sovereignty and the fullness of God. God's sovereignty and God's faithfulness. This should also be our declaration as Christians in Jesus Christ. This is the assurance that we too must hold fast to in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Redeemer. The Apostle Paul, he wrote about uh, this in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, when he talks about our spiritual blessings. And in verse 7, he says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. He also uh, talk, talks about this when he talks about our faith and how we should hold fast to that faith. He talks about this in Galatians uh, chapter 3 and start looking at verse 13. He says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. 14 that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And we're the Gentiles. All non-Jews are the Gentiles. And this is what, by God's grace and our faith in Jesus Christ, we inherit. We inherit this through our faith in Jesus Christ. He redeems us from our sins. And this here is the hope that we have to share to this dark and dying world that our, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, He lives and He lives within our hearts. This is that hope that we have to share. Just like Job held on to his hope, his faith that he had that God was going to one day get him out of it. He held on to that faith. We too must hold on to the profession of our faith without wavering. No matter what we're going through, God is with us. No matter what Satan throw in front of us, throw on our, inflict our bodies, whatever he does to us, just keep holding on because the Lord is with us. Back to the lesson, verse 26. And though after my skin worms destroyed this body, yet, in my flesh shall I see God. Do you see the level of confidence right here? Job here said, in my body I will see God. And when we think about a Job's situations and how unlikely uh, it would be that he would uh, see God in his body, it just continues uh, to highlight the depth of his faith. He was rooted in his faith and he had that great confidence that God God's justice would triumph over evil and this too is our future hope God's justice will triumph over evil here and now and to come God's justice will triumph over evil Verse 28, but ye should say, why persecute we him, seeing the root of the matter is found in me. And Job went back to his friends. Now he is calling shame on them again. It's like, how dare you go on persecuting me, saying that uh, this is my own fault, bearing a false witness uh, against me. You know, here we go again. That's what they were doing. They were bearing a false witness against him. And that was against the law. 
in, in Exodus 20 and verse 16, it says, you shall not bear fall weakness against your neighbor. And this is still true where we are today. And so, you know, we should examine ourselves about these things right here and ask ourselves if we have ever accused our friends or even someone of a gross sin without having any evidence. Because this kind of accusation, accusing one another without any kind of real proof is not pleasing to the Lord. And again, we too should not come to any conclusion based on what we see or what we think about a situation. We should always aim to get our facts straight first. And then if we see the need to confront, we should do it in love. That is what is pleasing to the Lord. Verse 29, be ye afraid of the sword, for wrath bringeth the punishments of the sword, that ye may know there is a judgment. And we continue to see how uh, Job continued to give out his warning. He's warning them how, because of how they were treating him, they themselves were in danger of punishment for their attitude and their behaviors towards him. And this way they will, they'll know that there is a judgment. There's one who is just. Actually, if we go to chapter uh, 42 at the end of uh, the book and I look at verse 7, it says, And it was so. That after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends. For you have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job has. Did you hear that? Verse 8. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullock and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up yourselves a burnt offering and my servant Job shall pray for you for him will I accept lest I deal with you after your folly in that you have not spoken of me the things which is right like my servant Job. We see here how the Lord made it very clear that Job's friends were wrong. What was going on with Job was between Job and the Lord. Job's a friend, they were assuming that he uh, did something wrong and that's why he, he was suffering. That's what caused uh, him to suffer because they were accusing him of committing great sin. What were they doing? Uh-huh. They were judging. They were judging without knowing what the Lord was doing. And again, we too must be careful to avoid making judgments about person because God may be working in ways we know nothing about. That is why we need to mind our business and leave God's business alone. And so, as we close, let us take a look at the Bible application, and it reads, There is so much suffering in the world we live in. During these times, many people turn to many things to medicate pain. Some turn to drugs, alcohol, sex. Others turn to milder things like shopping and food. Those who believe in Christ look to him as their redemption and hope. In our suffering, we can be assured that God is for us and not against us. Whether or not we are freed from our suffering, we will be able to see our Redeemer and be in his presence forever. We also uh, should note that asking the Lord's questions is a part of 
the healing process. When we think about times when we experience God's blessings, even in the midst of suffering, we can think that maybe uh, during that time of illnesses or loss of job or loss of income, whatever it is, we see how in the midst of suffering, God shows his love and shows us that he cares and that he is with us in our times of suffering. And so as we go through this week, let us have an aim. Let us have an aim to thank the Lord that he does not leave us alone in our time of suffering. And this will conclude our lesson. If you have heard something that was helpful to you, please give a like, share, subscribe, or even to leave a comment. But most importantly, remember, we are building the kingdom of God together one lesson at a time. God bless you. Until next time. Bye-bye.